Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Flavor of the Week, brought to you by Banditos, fresh made daily. In Flavor of the Week, Kyle sits down with one of our local priests over four different episodes to sample variations of a favorite food or drink while they discuss the ins and outs of life as a priest. This is Kyle Hyman here for Flavor of the Week Part 2 with Monsignor Bob Schulte. We've been trying some ice cream and I don't know where we go from here because last week you gave uh, us a, a 10 out of 10 on the, <laughs> the sea salted caramel truffle. Yeah, it was, it, really it, was it was very good. Very creamy. Maybe I was just real Sweet. hungry at that point. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this one was a uh, kind of like a rocky chocolate. road. New York chocolate chunky something. Okay, yeah, yeah. sounds good. Okay. All right. Chocolate. I'm into like chocolate once in a while. Mmm, it's good too. Is Rocky Road with chocolate ice cream or vanilla? You said that was your favorite. It can be both. Oh, okay. I've had both. This is more, yeah. This is kind of a cousin to Rocky Road, maybe. It's got yeah. It's got nuts in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or as you would have said, rocks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Back when I was a kid, yeah. There's chunks of chocolate here. Mm, it's really good. Mm-hmm. Very good. It's another good one. Mm. So I feel like we skipped a couple details last time. Did you have siblings growing up? I do. I had one sister, Sally. She's uh, seven years older than I. Okay. There was just the two of us growing up. My dad was an only child. He, he was uh, growing up. I know uh, I, my mom came from a family of three. There were, she was the youngest of three. Okay. So it's a small family. So I, actually, in a small family, we have hardly, I had like two first cousins. Yeah. <laughs> and so a few second cousins. So, you know, very small family compared to some families where they have like huge numbers of yeah. cousins and everything. And it was kind of, my sister was seven years older than me, mm-hmm. but she was also eight years ahead of me in school. So okay. like when she finished eighth grade and went to high school, then I started first grade at St. Yeah, Peter's. Yeah. So we were never really. So she probably wasn't grade. around when in eighth grade you're practicing or, or playing priest at home with your altar. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, she was around. Yeah. She was around. The okay. House, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. what did everybody think of you saying, I wanted to go to high school seminary? Were they surprised by that? Were they super supportive or? Yeah. You know, I, my parents were fine. They were supportive. You know, I, t- I told I told my, my mom and dad, I said, well, would you be disappointed that I won't continue on the family name because I'm, I was the only male the only son, in the yeah. family. And my mom said, no, he says, just as long as you're happy, I want you to be happy what you're doing. Uh-huh. You know, so, and I know when it was interesting after I was in the seminary for a while, and this is when I was in the college seminary later on, I'd been in college for a while. Mm-hmm. I know when I came home one weekend, and this was during the late 60s when a lot of turmoil in the church and priests leaving the priesthood. She always said, now I don't want you to become a priest just because you think it's something I want you to do, but yeah. we want you to do. You know, we, we're supportive of that, but don't do this because you think it's something you want to please us. Uh-huh. And I told her, I said, wow, I said, I w- certainly wouldn't do that anyway, <laughs> but you know, yeah. It's, and, 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 you know, I appreciated that freedom that she yeah. gave me, you know, so, because for some of the guys in my that were in the seminary. I know for some of them to leave the seminary was a very d- big disappointment for their parents, you uh-huh. know, and, and it was really kind of a tough burden for them to bear. But I didn't feel that pressure in my family at all. Which it seems like there were also men who became priests and then left the priesthood. Correct. Or do you think that was because of some of the pressure of you're in seminary, you can't you can't quit now? And so then they went into the priesthood not... Well, Being actually called to the priesthood? Yeah, you know, I, I haven't really ever done a survey of any of those people, Kyle, and ask them too much about it. You know, like some of the guys that left, uh, it became, they met a girl, and this became, you know, kind of a, a whole new avenue in their life that, mm-hmm. uh, of that, that what they wanted to do. And so that was kind of part of the impetus of them leaving while they were in the seminary. I think uh-huh. that happened sometimes with priests too, or sometimes with priests, they felt isolated or alone in the priesthood. And I think because of that, I think they were looking for companionship, you know, mm-hmm. in some other ways. I mean, I felt there's isolation in the priesthood. I mean, there are there's times of loneliness, but I mean, there are in the time of anybody. I mean, I've talked to married people. I said, sure. you had the same sure. experience sometimes. You know, so it's not, I didn't, I never thought of it as terribly unusual. And, and I always felt a lot of support from the parish community. 
after I went to the high school seminary at Wawasi, I went to St. Meinrad Seminary in Southern Indiana. Yeah. And I was a Benedictine monastery. And I think one of the influences of of my understanding of priesthood was that sense of community that St. Meinrad had. As a Benedictine community, it was a monastery. I had close to 100 monks living there together. I got to know several of those monks. And just the you know the struggles that they were experiencing with, with religious life, but also the belongingness and the companionship that they sure. had as part of that. It gave, kind of gave me a vision for what my priesthood was going to be like. I said, okay, I, I thought seriously about being a Benedictine you know, uh-huh. priest. But then I, I really felt like, no, I wanted, I really feel called by the Lord after prayer, the, the Dawson priesthood. But I want to, I want to have, always think of the parish as my family. This is my family. These are the people that I'm, I'm a part of. These are the people whose lives I want to be a part of. You know, if they invite me to attend things, I'm going to go. I mean, you know, if they want to, I want to talk to them. I want to be, get to know them yeah. as a family. Yeah. I think approaching the parish that way, and to me, the highlight of the priesthood each week is Sunday Mass, when mm-hmm. you have Mass with the community, and the whole community is gathered together in prayer. And you greet the people before Mass, after Mass, yeah. and things like that. You know, That, I think, keeps the isolation and, and the sense of aloneness you know, quite a bit at bay. <laughs> yeah. So you don't regret choosing diocesan priesthood over the religious life like a Benedictine? No, not at all. I like to be rooted. I mean, Fort Wayne is where I grew up in this diocese in mm-hmm. northeast Indiana, and it's become you know, where I'm very comfortable and very much at home. And there's a certain uh, personality and, and characteristics of the Midwest, the upper Midwest here. And yeah. I think it's just kind of a... I've visited other places. I've talked to my classmates in other places, and it's a different... Um, environment in a sense for the church as well as for just the society and things. Yeah, I think sometimes we can take it for granted the support for Catholicism that there is around here. And, you know, we might complain about a few things here or there, but we really do have a pretty active community and diocese here. Right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. I was coming over through the school and I was walking down the hallway and one of the eighth graders came out of a classroom and almost hit me with the door because the door swings out in the uh-huh. hallway. <laughs> and he says, Oh, he says, I'm sorry. Uh, he was very apologetic. And he says, oh, are you? And he was holding the door. And he said, are you going to go in here? And I said, no, no, I'm just going down the hallway. He says, uh-huh. okay, okay, thank you. And he was <laughs> he was heading off to the bathroom or something. But, but he was just so polite. I said, <laughs> there's this you know, young teenager who's so polite and everything. And it's, it's, I think that's very typical of the kids here. Yeah. So what were some of your assignments before getting assigned to the cathedral? Um, my first assignment was at Sacred Heart in Fort Wayne, southeast side of town. Sure. And uh, it was a smaller parish. It had a school, but it was it was neat. I was just there with the, just the pastor and myself, and we had a really. Uh, I I was thought it was a great experience. Actually, I was there as a deacon. I did an internship there, and when Kyle, when when we were in the seminary, our internship was kind of split up. We were in the parish for three months in the summer, so June, July, August. Uh-huh. Then we went back to the seminary for one semester. Okay, And then in January, we came back to the parish, and we were there for five months until we got ordained the end of May. Same parish or a different one? Same parish. Okay. So I was at Sacred Heart that summer, and mm-hmm. then I came back in January and was there. Until, and then after I got ordained, I was assigned as assistant pastor there. Gotcha. So actually, I was there. Was that typical? Um, that not, your internship not necessarily would typical. Okay. It, it happened sometimes, but it was not typical. Uh-huh. So, I was, so I was blessed with that in a sense because that, that really... I was at Sacred Heart for uh, almost six years then, so it was okay. really before before I got moved. One of the things that happened um, after I was there a couple of years, I was asked by the bishop to investigate the idea of a permanent deacon program in the diocese because it's something that um, we had some permanent deacons, but they were formed by a program up in South Bend, and it was kind of a, a self-oriented uh, program. I mean, they kind of, uh, huh. they, the, the deacons kind of uh, put together the program. I mean, the deacon candidates kind of put the program together themselves. Uh-huh. They were very educated men from Notre Dame. Anyway, um, so he wanted it in a, a program that was more diocesan-oriented and everything. So we put together a program, and I actually went out, and um, I think we had like 50 people apply. It was a m- tremendous number of people, and we ended up accepting, I think, 25 into the program. Oh, wow. And then it ran the program. It was, three, it was a three-year at that point, three-year formation program. And they were ordained in 1983. 
So I started that while I was still at Sacred Heart, and then and then the bishop asked me to also be vocation director for the diocese in charge of seminarians and, and um, screening for the seminary and things like that. I had an office downtown at the Chancery, so I worked full-time at the Chancery. And at that point, I really wanted to just be in residence in a parish. And I was so embedded in Sacred Heart by that time. I've been there almost uh-huh. six years. So I said, I really need to change. I really need to be in an environment where I wasn't so people weren't asking me to do stuff all the time you know? yeah yeah because Pastoral, of your other obligations because i had other yeah things and i was doing a lot of traveling up to south bend and around the diocese so i ended up i moved out to our lady of good hope as a, in residence out there and i was out there actually eight years i lived out there eight years and that was a neat uh, experience out there I was but, with, but you're still full-time at the chancery right right i was full-time at the chancery okay. yeah and i'd be driving in <laughs> In the morning, I'd come celebrate the mass at the chapel at eight o'clock in the morning, and I was driving in traffic. If I left Our Lady of Good Hope by seven twenty-five, I could make it by eight o'clock down there. Uh-huh. If I left at seven thirty, the traffic was so bad I'd be late for mass. Yeah, <laughs> it's just as I felt like okay, I'm I, here. I am this priest. I'm driving in rush hour traffic every day, you know, yeah. to get into town, you know, whatever Fort Wayne rush hour traffic right, is. Right. <laughs> but you know, it takes longer. Yeah. But anyway, I enjoyed that ministry and working. And then, and then uh, toward the end of that time, Bishop Darcy at that point asked me to consider um, starting a new parish on Southwest Side in a Boyd Township. They'd had a community that had been meeting there for some time. They were off of a kind of a satellite parish off of St. Joseph. Hmm. And the priest would go out and offer mass in a public school every Sunday. Mm-hmm. I'd say when we started out there, we had everything in a cardboard box. It was roughly uh, two and a half feet long and by a foot wide and about a foot tall. Everything we had in the cardboard box, that was what the parish started out with when I started in January. Which uh, would have been what? Um, candles, chalice, <laughs> okay. altar linens, <laughs> that, um, <that's> it. bread, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> books, okay, vestments, <laughs> all the stuff you needed for mass. Wow. They had a cafetorium all set up theater style and they had a table on stage uh-huh. and that was where we said mass. <laughs> that's how we started. So by the time I started, we had two masses on Sunday morning and then we started a Saturday night mass as well. So we had and uh, it took us two All and a half. All at the public school. Yeah, at the public school, Haverhill School. Okay. But it took about two years, nine months, and we got the church built, and we were able to move in the church then wow. and have the mass in the church then from there on. So that was a great experience of forming the parish and kind of getting it together. The parish was already kind of, they were the community was formed, but it was just a matter of now we're an identity, now we're a parish, and we were named after St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. The bishop really wanted to name a parish after a woman. We hadn't had... We don't have that many parishes oh, yeah. in the diocese named after women, and she was an American saint. And uh-huh. So that was a kind of. A, so is that Bishop's choice for that? Yes, Bishop Darcy's choice. Yeah, okay. right. yeah. He asked me for input, and I said, uh, I got a special devotion to Kateri Tekakwitha. Okay. Uh, from when I was a kid, I read about her life. And Who really, was uh, blessed at the time? Yes. Okay. And in order to name a parish after a blessed, you need to have special permission from the rome okay and so we didn't want to wait that long yeah and i didn't want to start a parish and saying well okay we're not sure what our name is right. but it might be this but we don't know you know so that's why saint elizabeth seton was probably would have been one of the one of the first churches yeah named that yeah yeah but right. then you would have had to change the name to saint right Could right you? yeah yeah that's true that's true yeah yeah, yeah. At some point. So anyway, but St. Elizabeth Seton, that was a great, she's a great saint, a yeah. great, great patron for the patroness for the parish. All right. Well, I have so many questions about that, but we're out of time. So uh, <laughs> I guess my final question will be, what do you think of the New York chocolate? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, this is really good. The last one I gave a 10. So this one I got to give at least a nine. This is really good. It is good. Mm-hmm. All what right. Well, like? thank you yeah. so much, Monsignor Bob Schulte. We'll have more on upcoming episodes of Flavor of the Week. Mm-hmm.